Up next, we have world-renowned neuroscientist Mary Helen Imordino Yang. She's a professor of education, psychology, and neuroscience at the University of Southern California. She's also director of the USC Center for Effective Neuroscience Development, Learning, and Education. She studies the psychological and neurobiological development of emotion and self-awareness, as well as social, cognitive, and moral development in educational settings. Yes, she is very smart. Well, we all want better brains, right? Professor Imardino Yang is going to speak to us about what she calls the Frankenstein problem. Wow, that is an intriguing title, Mary Helen. Welcome. Thank you, Mary. Um, and and I, I hope by the end of this little talk, the title will be clear to you. I'm, it, it is meant to be a little bit provocative, but I think it's interesting. Um, so uh, thank you so much for having me to speak about this really important topic. It is really now just laid bare, especially by the pandemic, just how important kids' relationships, their emotions, their uh, ways of making sense out of the things they witness and feel are for the way in which they develop. And what the science is really revealing, I think in my lab and others, is that the emotions that we engage in with each other, you know, starting with kind of basic empathy, but then also the way that like a curriculum like Roots of Empathy teaches young people to really notice others' development, others' emotions, others' needs and, you know, and, and their behaviors and how they're feeling, those kinds of empathic uh, emotions that people engage with um, are not just about, you know, developing your ability to be a good social person. They're also really about the same, developing the same brain platforms that you think about other things on. And I'm going to start to show you why that's the case. Um, uh, so uh, this really speaks to the importance, the really fundamental importance of empathy and social interaction in brain development, not just in brain development for uh, being a good social human, but also brain development for thinking about math and anything else that you want to think about. Um, so I like to start this talk with um, a picture of a painting by a colleague of mine, a friend, Margaret Lazari, who um, you know, painted this huge seascape. In real life, it's like six by eight feet. And, and, and what's in here is kind of these white squiggles in the middle and, and you know, uh, they look kind of like waves in the water or maybe they look like reflections of clouds. What they actually are is the white matter from a person's brain, some brave volunteer who got in our MRI scanner and let us take pictures of their brain. And then we peeled off the outside, all the little cells that, um, you know, that do the, the, the firing, right? And, and what's left underneath, and let me just be clear, we, we peel it off the picture, right? Not off the person. <laughs> um, but then what's left underneath is this massively interconnected, literally billions of little, you know, tubes of salt water that are making sometimes hundreds of thousands of synaptic connections onto other ones, right? Uh, all around the space of your head in these organized patterns and all the way down in, you know, uh, via other connections to other neurons, all the way down into your whole body, uh, all the way to the ends of your fingers and toes and back up again, right? That this is really an image to me of the network that makes this person who she is, right? Um, and that network is developed based on our genetics, based on our evolutionary history as a species, but also what we're discovering is that it is strikingly dependent uh, on the ways that we feel and think and relate with other people in our life, that we have very uh, uh, important kind of need for interdependence on other people in order to grow our brains. Genetically, what we inherit is not a, a bunch of DNA that tells our body and brain how to grow. It's, it's more like a set of contingency plans that basically says, if you land yourself in a world like this, grow like this. And if your world is more like that, then grow yourself in this other way, right? And we can actually see that the patterns of thinking and feeling that young people engage in 
are shaping the kind of brain they grow. And that's why it's so critically important to uh, support young people's development in a way that really helps them situate themselves in social relationships, in abilities to notice other people's feelings, to reflect on those feelings, to think about how your own activities and your own thinking and behavior are impacting on other people, and to create things that are constructive together as friends and as, uh, and as neighbors. This is just the fundamental um, force in brain development. Uh, and and a, a program like Roots of Empathy really capitalizes on that to help teach young people how to learn to notice how others are feeling and how you're feeling and to use that to think strategically and purposefully about, uh, about how you want to behave and what you want to think and feel like. And, and that's the essence of healthy development right there. Um, so I put up this picture of, uh, it's not me, a lot of people think it's me. I don't put pictures of myself in my talks, but it's a picture of my my sister and my little niece, Nina, when she was first born. This is, Nina was born in an emergency C-section where she and her twin sister and my sister were all anesthetized um, during the birth. And this is uh, the first time that they've kind of met each other when they're both awake. And, and there's so much you can talk about in this image, but what I want you to just think about for a moment is, where is the social piece of this image, right? What's going on socially here? What's going on cognitively here in both partners? What's going on emotionally here? How is this image representing a cultural way of bringing a young baby into the world and of interacting with that baby that might look different in different places? How is this, uh, how is this, um, demonstrating a personal way that, you know, that, that my little niece Nina is, is kind of asking for what she needs, right? That, that magic moment where you kind of lock eyes with an infant. Infants bring to this world, uh, neurologically uh, typical infants bring to this world a kind of uh, uh, reflex in their, in their visual system that's built in that says, when you see two dark dots in this kind of configuration, a stare, right? And for a newborn infant, that's completely automatic. If they're awake and their eyes are open, uh, and you can you can get them to do this, right? And and then the question is, well, what's it for, right? And that's where other people show the baby, right? Like, ooh, stare over here, and look, it's the beginnings of a relationship with your mom, right? It's the beginnings of you coming to be a human with me, engaging with me in what we might call a relationship that we hope will last our entire lives, right? And, and what we're learning is that that engagement, it's built reflexively at the beginning. We come with these kind of basic predispositions to do certain things in the world. And, and the most powerful predisposition that infants bring is a very social one. It's to engage with other human beings, right? And, uh, and then that gets used and shaped and elaborated over time into all of the ways that we culturally um, live together, both around ideas and values and around the direct ways in which we interact in real and person um, you know, encounters. And, and so what I want you to see here is that our development from the very get-go is inherently social. Nina's biology comes expecting there to be a human to look at when she opens her eyes. And then my sister comes saying like, I'm expecting you to show me what you need. Let's build something together. And that kind of what I call empathic resonance is the essence of human development. And a, a curriculum like Roots of Empathy is capitalizing on that. As kids become older and more capable of thinking complexly, they start to be able to cognitively elaborate the story and the meaning of their interactions and of the things that they notice in other people. And it becomes increasingly about ideas and values and beliefs uh, and 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 still about the direct interpersonal interaction, but that piece is only a part of it by then. And so, what you need is high quality direct interactions that then become the fodder for this deeper, more elaborate cognitive and emotional meaning making that extends across a person's lifespan and makes them 
uh, a person who's able to really engage with others, to engage with themselves, to be happy, to be healthy, um, and to be a good citizen in all the senses in which that entails. So this is a little, don't try to read it unless you're a kindergarten teacher, uh, uh, I'll just read it to you. But this is a little poem or song actually that my daughter wrote when she was in kindergarten for her baby brother, Theodore, uh, who she calls Teddy. And you can see, she's, this is just, I basically just scanned a picture of what she drew with her crayons. It's her in her little dress and she's there uh, singing and she's got her little music stand there. So you see a little bit of cultural knowledge about what she was doing. And she says, I won't sing for you. Okay, I'll just, uh, I'll just, uh, just read it. But she says, oh, Teddy, we love you more than the whole earth size. As the earth spins every day, we love you as much as usual, but sometimes even more as you make us proud and happy that you're you. And so, you know, what is this about? Is this a poem about this little girl's love for her baby brother? Or is this a poem about her budding interest in planetary science, right? Which she's now studying in college. It's both, right? Our empathic emotions and our ability to have uh, relationships with people are the foundation on which we come to understand and build other kinds of knowledge. They are truly not separate. And just in the last few minutes, I'm going to show you a little bit of what this looks like in the brain. It turns out that the empathic emotions uh, that you feel when we ask people in the scanner to do this are uh, the same brain systems that literally keep you alive, that the emotions you feel utilize the same brain systems that make you uh, conscious and able to breathe and your heart to keep beating. Um, no wonder they're so fundamental to our well-being and to our thinking. Um, so this is a picture of where in the brain became systematically more active, the orange, right? More blood being taken up, more neurons firing when people said they felt really strongly about a social story and were really thinking about it and it was very meaningful to them. And I just want to point out a couple of the main findings here. Um, the first is circled in blue here, the brain stem. This is a part of the brain that's way down low that we basically share with alligators. What this shows is that this region of the brain, which is essential for survival, if you get damage in here, you get profound disturbances of consciousness like coma or even death, right? And these regions of the brain are activated when people are thinking about social stories that feel very meaningful to them. And then we also have something called the anterior insula, which is kind of, if we slice this way and look inside these big pieces of cortex up at the top, what do these do? These are basically visceral somatomotor cortex. If you poke them in a neurosurgery experiment where a person's awake, the person like vomits, right? This is the same part of the brain that feels and regulates your guts and your viscera, it tells you if your lunch isn't sitting right with you or if your heart's pounding. These are the platforms in the brain on which we feel emotions and on which we steer our thinking. They're not separate. No wonder my daughter wrote a poem about her love for her baby brother and her understanding of the planet Earth, right? They go together in our minds. They're simply not separate. And that's where we get to the essence of that Frankenstein title, right? That our ability to feel emotions and our ability to understand things is not a bunch of little mechanisms that you know scientists can stitch together to apply the science to people and you know, hope not to make a monster in the middle. It's instead this deeply integrative sort of co-layering of all these different ways of being and understanding that are at their essence fundamentally about building off of the emotions we have about other people and situating our own experience of ourself in the most direct, basic, kind of embodied sensation way, right, as the anterior insula activity shows us, into this thinking process. And, and that is really the fundamental thing that matters for children's development and thinking across domains. So just to sum up, I've got my little nephew here, Nina's older brother, um, who's kind of showing us that what this is all about is really about learning to experience your own self via a kind of a mirror onto other people. And that what really healthy development does is allow us 
to engage systematically with others and with self in these fluid co-constructed interactions in which we really come together as friends, as colleagues, as you know, fellow humans to construct our well-being, to construct our ways of thinking and understanding, to build beliefs and values, and to engage with each other's perspectives in ways that allow us to really be purposeful, be thoughtful, be ethical, be productive humans who can really work together through our lifespans and, and also understand the ways in which we're impacting on each other and the ways in which we're impacting on, for example, the planet. So just to sum up, emotions, they happen, right? They're automatic, but we need to learn how to feel our emotions. And that is what a curriculum like Roots of Empathy does for us. On this slide, I have some resources for you. If you're interested, on the left is uh, a free uh, 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 brief that I wrote um, together with a student and with, uh, with Linda Darling Hammond, who's um, a, a policymaker in education about the evidence base for the interdependence of emotional and social and cultural ways of knowing and being on the one hand in the brain and the brain systems that support academic thinking and development on the other hand and how these are really not separate and what that means for educational policy and practice that's a freely available brief on the right is a is a book that um that you can also purchase that has um you know a, a selection of articles that uh, teachers, policymakers, parents might be interested in where we really present the science in a deeper way uh, and kind of put that all into one volume so you can access it. Um, and so uh, to close, thank you for the work that you do. It's among the most important work on the planet is generating, you know, the well-being and the feelings in our next uh, generation of little citizens. And thank you on behalf of the kids and back to you, Mary. Love that talk, Mary Helen. Thank you so much. You know, I think it really surprised a lot of people because there's a general assumption that social skills like empathy have nothing to do with learning subjects like math or science. And I find on reflection of the talks we've been hearing uh, throughout the symposium, there is this interconnectedness uh, of all these different areas of ourselves. You know, I guess it's the old saying that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. And back to that Frankenstein myth that you were trying to dispel. Um, yeah, it's just a, a fascinating talk.